Good morning. Good afternoon. We have good news for you today. For 67 days, our coronavirus task force has worked day and night to find the resources to make every man, woman, and child in Maine safe. Every day in these briefings, Dr. Shah has talked about the critical need for testing for the virus in any number of settings, particularly when it comes to protecting our most vulnerable people and our frontline workers whose lives are on the line every day. Last week, we talked about how important testing is to our firm desire to reopen the economy while taking every appropriate measure to protect the lives and health of customers, staff, business owners, visitors, and residents in every corner of our state. Today, we are very pleased to announce a partnership with IDEX, the well-known Westbrook-based company that employs 3,000 people in our state and worldwide leader in the production of diagnostics who have partnered with us to provide COVID-19 test materials sufficient to more than triple our current testing capacity. While this deal was in the works, we waited for the FDA in Washington to give final emergency use approval to IDEX's new diagnostic program. That approval arrived this morning. This changes everything. For weeks, my administration has been in discussions with IDEX to ensure that people of Maine would be the beneficiaries of their new test kits should FDA approve them. And now we have that approval. And as a result of this partnership, the state of Maine will have enough of these kits to run at least 5,000 tests per week for the foreseeable future. In combination with Maine CDC's current capacity of 2,000 tests per week, our total testing capacity, as I said, is now more than tripled. These numbers are in addition to tests conducted for Maine residents by non-governmental labs, both inside and outside the state. Additionally, I am so pleased to say that IDEX is lending a testing platform to the Maine CDC's laboratory to help accommodate the higher testing volume. And they are generously donating enough test kits to conduct an additional 3,500 tests. This significant expansion of testing will ultimately allow Maine CDC to eliminate its testing prioritization system, the system like that in most other states, which we've all had to implement as a result of the limited national supply of testing materials. Once the testing with this new platform and materials is operational, which may be as early as the end of next week, health care providers all across Maine will be able to seek testing for anyone they suspect of having COVID-19, including not simply people with symptoms, but also people who've had close contact with a person with COVID-19, like a spouse. Furthermore, this breakthrough in capacity will allow the state to more fully implement universal testing in congregate care settings at first, such as nursing homes, nursing facilities, and shelters, and will enable the state to work with providers to conduct voluntary sentinel testing, or spot checks, on patients in different parts of the healthcare system. The expansion of testing is also crucial to our gradual restarting of the economy. And it's one of the four guiding principles in my vision for reopening Maine that I articulated last week. With this additional capacity, Maine CDC will better be able to gauge the prevalence of the virus throughout the state. And that data in turn will help inform the appropriateness of lifting certain restrictions safely and moving through our various reopening stages. As a result of the new testing capacity, we, we do expect to update the plan to restart Maine's economy very soon. Even with this announcement, however, my administration will continue our efforts to secure more testing as part of our ongoing commitment to Maine's public health. For example, the Maine CDC under Dr. Shah has also recently received testing supplies for another recently purchased testing platform, which will further expand capacity. Additionally, I will continue to press the federal government to ensure that health care providers in Maine have an adequate and reliable supply of materials, such as swabs, to collect samples for, from patients for testing. But this is a game changer for Maine and for our people. I know for some it may not seem like a big deal and 
Lord knows, a year ago, if you told me I might get a little emotional over a, a new diagnostic test for some strange and novel virus, I would have thought that was pretty odd. Today, in very different times, we welcome good news in any form and in any way it comes to us. And today, with partnership with a Maine-based company, this is very good news. The other day, uh, a retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel sent me a quote from Albert Camus, she, who said, quote, In the midst of winter, I finally learned there was in me an invincible summer. Thank you, Katie from Saco, for that note. And as we move along through an anxious spring, anticipating better seasons to come, I would paraphrase, paraphrase Camus and say, in the midst of our long winter, the people of Maine and the people of our nation have found within themselves an invincible summer. So on behalf of this administration and on behalf of the 1.3 million people of Maine, I thank IDEX for their ingenuity, their generosity, and their new partnership with us. Acts like this demonstrate to us the heart of Maine's extraordinary companies and the power of public-private collaboration. Our state is grateful. Thank you. And I would like to turn this over to Dr. Shah for his briefing. Thank you so much, Governor Mills. Good afternoon, or good morning, everyone. My name is Nirav Shah the director of the state of Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And Governor Mills and I are joined today with, by Commissioner Jean Lambrew from the Department of Health and Human Services. As the governor mentioned, we're here to announce good news today in the form of new testing made available by our colleagues at IDEX. I'll talk more a bit, a bit more about the testing and the way in which that will enhance our public health response to the coronavirus situation. But first, I'd like to review some of the latest data about that outbreak. Overall in Maine, there are now 1,330 cases of coronavirus confirmed across the state. That's a significant increase of 76 cases since yesterday. As we've talked about for the past few days, however, that increase includes a number of tests that have been conducted over the past three and a half days by our colleagues at Tyson Foods in Portland. Overall, that one, that those 76 new cases include a total of 39 cases that were the result of our recommended universal testing at the Tyson facility in Portland. In addition, those 76 cases also include 13 cases in total at the Springbrook, Springbrook nursing facility as well. 12 residents and one staff member there have tested positive for COVID-19. In general, of that 1,330 cases, 1,231 have been laboratory confirmed and 99 remain probable. Overall, there have been 192 Maine people who have been hospitalized with COVID-19. And at present, there are 39 who are hospitalized, 16 of whom are in the intensive care unit and 11 of whom are on ventilators. Overall, there have been 62 individuals who have passed away with COVID-19 and 787 who have now recovered. Of those 1,330 cases, 286 have been among healthcare workers. And again, as I noted, of that new set of cases today of 76, a total of 52 of those cases are associated with two outbreaks, one at the Tyson facility the other at the Springbrook facility. This increase in cases has been anticipated for several days now, as I've reported. And given the nature of the facility level outbreaks that we're seeing across the state, we do continue to expect finding more cases within long-term care facilities and other congregate living facility settings across the state. I'd like to provide a quick update on the Tyson situation as it stands right now. Overall, there have been 51 cases that have been found at the Tyson facility as a result of our recommendation to proceed with universal testing. Now, those 51 cases include primarily employees and a few individuals who are contractors at the facility. 
As, is we, as we always do in situations like this, Maine CDC epidemiologists have been and are continuing to reach out to each and every one of the individuals who have been confirmed as positive to, go, to provide them guidance on how to stay safe during their period of isolation and check in with them to see if there are other health care or social needs that they may require in order to stay safe and healthy. The facility has completed its deep cleaning process and as we've been report as as has been reported to us by the facility, they have begun the process of reopening and today are operating at one quarter capacity and will continue to reevaluate their operations on a daily basis. At the Springbrook Center, where I discussed an, an outbreak that we had just been notified of yesterday, as I mentioned, we've now become aware of 13 cases that are the result of universal testing that Maine CDC recommended at that facility. The testing is almost complete. There are still five cases that remain pending, but of those, of all the tests that were done, nearly 300, a total of 13 individuals have come back as testing, as testing positive. We will, of course, continue to work with the facility to provide them guidance on proper infection control practices and have already, are already in the process of sending them an emergency tranche of PPE for their healthcare workers to make sure that they can stay safe. The other day, I mentioned that Maine CDC had started to receive shipments of swabs and viral transport media from the federal government. We received an initial uh, set of 4,000 swabs and anticipate receiving more and more swabs on a weekly basis for the forthcoming several weeks. We're also receiving transport media. This is the gel that the swabs are placed in after a patient has been swabbed as that material is being transported up to our lab in Augusta. What Maine CDC is planning on doing is starting the process of distributing those swabs to healthcare facilities across the state, namely hospitals, as well as distributing that viral transport media to those hospitals. This allows the hospitals and other facilities to make pre-made test kits that can be used very quickly to swab patients put the swab in the transport media and send it up to our lab in Augusta for rapid testing. So we'll begin, but we're going to begin deploying those swabs out in the very, very near future. I'd finally like to just provide a couple of pieces of insight from a public health perspective on the value of this new partnership that Governor Mills just discussed with IDEX. Among many things, the scientific benefit of today's partnership is that it allows us to access the vast, sophisticated, and local supply of reagents from our colleagues at IDEX. As everyone who's been tuning in to these briefings has heard, these reagents have been in short supply at a national level, prompting all states, including Maine, to introduce a tiered prioritization system at our laboratory here in Augusta. The availability of these reagents, which are a critical part of the overall chemical reaction that testing re relies upon, the availability of these reagents continues to be a significant constraint on all states' abilities to increase testing. But today's announcement changes that. Today's announcement will allow Maine CDC to work toward and very soon remove the tiered testing system that Maine and all other states have had to implement. In fact, this announcement and the removal of that tiered testing system will actually make Maine one of the first state health department laboratories, if not the first, to remove all criteria and all tiers on its testing system. Now, as the governor mentioned, we are in the process of receiving the tests, receiving the instruments needed to do the test, and there's still a ways to go before we're fully online. The instruments have to be installed, they have to be calibrated, they have to be validated, and we have to pass our own proficiency testing requirements. But once all of those steps are undertaken, we will be able, after all of that is done, to announce in the near future that we're removing the testing requirements for the main state laboratory, and in so doing, we'll continue being in the vanguard of testing across the states.
Whether it was moving toward including individuals from congregate care settings in our top priority, or quickly moving toward recommending universal testing in congregate care settings, this latest news is further evidence of the innovation and ingenuity that can help all of us in Maine work together toward solving problems. It will put us closer to our goal of ensuring that every medical provider in Maine who wishes to obtain a test for any patient can do so without concern for availability. It will also allow us to continue being a leader on universal testing in congregate care settings, such as nursing homes, group homes, and shelters for people experiencing homelessness. This public-private partnership between Maine CDC, the state of Maine government, and IDEX will allow us to more than triple our testing capacity here in Maine, as the governor mentioned, as well as return those results back to providers in a timely fashion. On a day when we have just reported 76 new cases, 52 of which are associated with large outbreaks. This breakthrough today with IDEX underscores the need for expansive testing capacity within the state of Maine, which will allow Maine CDC to continue rapidly responding to outbreaks across the state. I'd like to thank the governor, Commissioner Lambrew, and our colleagues at IDEX for their months of work and partnership with Maine and allow us to continue, that will allow us to continue looking forward and addressing the, COVID common, the common COVID-19 challenge across the state. Thank you very much, everyone. And we'll turn now to our colleagues in the media for some questions. And today's quest, first question goes to Dustin Vlodkowski from New England Cable News. Go ahead, Dustin. Hi, Governor and Dr. Shah. I've got a question for each of you, starting with the governor. Okay. So, Governor Mills, what is the long-term plan with the additional data from the tests? And what I mean by that is, will we eventually see universal testing in Maine and then people in state or from away being allowed to travel or do certain things based on test results? <clears throat> Those two things are uh, compatible ideals, goals, and we will work towards reaching those kinds of goals. Um, when you say universal testing, I don't, do you mean every, everybody, all 1.3 million people in Maine and everybody coming into Maine? Or we have, we are going, moving towards universal testing in facilities right now. That's what, that's our immediate goal. And yes, the advanced uh, capacity of testing will help us remove some of the restrictions on expanding our economy. Uh, in a sooner time frame. And, uh, and for Dr. Shaw, can you talk a little bit more about the sustainability of this IDEX platform and how this makes us, it sounds, stand out among other states in the country? So uh, Dustin asks about the sustainability of the platform and, and how that will put, help continue keeping us at the front of the pack. Among the many benefits of this arrangement, this partnership with IDEX, is not so much that their testing strategy is one that's been validated by the US FDA, but it's their ability to have a really deep bench in producing these reagents that have been in such short supply across the country. The partnership with IDEX means that we will be able to take advantage of their vast ability to produce reagents and not have to rely solely on the federal government or other sources for reagents. We all know that those reagents have been in high demand and thus in short supply. This announcement means that we will have our independent ability to work with IDEX to keep a steady stream of reagents. This is a first step. If we determine that we need to continue increasing that supply of tests, we can discuss that with IDEX. But today's first step, more than tripling our overall capacity, gives us a steady stream of access to these necessary reagents, and we hope that we'll continue to do so in the future. Thanks a lot, Dustin. Uh, we will turn now to Don Kerrigan over at News Center. Don may be walking his cat. His cat's so on the microphone. We're back to Don in just a second and uh, turn next. Good morning. To oh, oh, there Don. he is. He's okay. back. Yeah, sorry. I, uh, star six. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, for, uh, 
One for Dr. Shaw and one for uh, both the doctor and the governor. Okay. Uh, the first is, is there a is there a breakthrough with this test? Is it a different type of test than you are currently doing as opposed to just allowing more of the chemical reagents? And I'll ask that one first and then I'll ask the second if that's okay. Uh, I will I will be happy to field that. Don's question is, in what ways does this test differ from the testing that we're doing? And and Don, it is it is the same type of test. It's a type of test that looks for the genetic particles, the genetic material from the virus that causes COVID-19 from that coronavirus. So in that respect, it's the same type of test that we have been doing at our laboratory. It uses slightly different equipment. And thankfully, our colleagues at IDEX uh, uh, lent us one of their pieces of equipment and we independently acquired another of that same piece of equipment. So we've got two of the machines that are necessary for running the test that'll allow us to keep a high throughput. But again, one of the, uh, one of the many ben scientific benefits is not so much that it's a new test, but it's the same type of test with a very strong supply chain of these necessary reagents. The other question is a viewer contacted me and suggested that the the need to dramatically expand the amount of testing is more of a manufacturing process issue than a public health one and suggested that that Maine would do well to hire a company with expertise in manufacturing and process to manage the whole testing procedure and to make it more efficient and be able to get more of these through. Has that been thought about? And could that, would that possibly be a, a worthwhile change? Well, it sort of relates back to the Abbott situation, where a month ago, Abbott was quickly approved for rapid testing uh, of this sort. Um, and the federal government then sort of requisitioned, issued a purchase order, requisitioning most of their supplies and then distributing them um, in a fashion that did not favor Maine and other rural states. It favored the hot spots um, for reasons that the federal government can explain. But uh, we've been pressuring the federal government to prevent us from becoming a hot spot by supplying more of those tests to us and to other rural states. So manufacturing, I guess, there are a lot of people, a lot of entities manufacturing tests, and some of them are under the Defense Production Act um, proclamation by the, the president, uh, so under a certain duty to uh, manufacture certain amounts of tests at a certain price paid for by the federal, federal government and distributed by the federal government. I don't know that it's a matter of manufacturing, but having access and having access in Maine to a product that is made here with a pretty quick turnaround so that we're not transporting specimens out of state and having to wait for days for those test results to come back to us. Mm -hmm. but, Governor, Governor, if I could interrupt quickly, I, I guess I misstated. Okay. This, this, sugge this suggestion was to have uh, a, a business with, the, with process expertise to actually, in Maine, manage the whole testing procedure and the, the flow and increase the efficiency of it. I, I'm not sure what they're... So I, I, I hear where that's coming from, Don, and that's not inconsistent with anything that's being done right now. Uh, there are multiple organizations in Maine that can offer and conduct laboratory testing. Quest, LabCorp, a number of other commercial labs are already working with doctor's offices across the state to conduct lab testing. We also have a specific and unique role as a public health laboratory as well. And that role can't be one that can be simply outsourced to someone else. Our public health laboratory often does mass testing in situations that other laboratories might not. For example, in shelters for people experiencing homelessness. That's why it was really important to us to make sure we had as robust a capability as possible within our state level laboratory, within our state, to be able to run those tests in those situations, whether they be homeless shelters, nursing homes, at a mass level to try to get a handle on situations. Uh, I'm gonna turn next, thanks Don. I'm gonna turn next to Caitlin Andrews over at the BDN. Good morning, thank you for hosting the call. Um, I have one question for the governor and then one question for um, Dr. Sean Commissioner Lambrew. Um, 
Governor, I feel like we kind of touched on this earlier, but I just kind of want to circle back and ask again how the IDEX um, testing partnership factors into any plans to test visitors coming into Maine, which Commissioner Johnson and other states such as Vermont have floated as a way of getting around um, some of the lodging restrictions. It's a step in the right direction. As I said, the four principles of us gradually safely reopening our economy include protecting the public health, maintaining health care readiness, building reliable and access accessible testing, and prioritizing public-private collaboration. We're now doing all of those four things. We're addressing all four parts of the puzzle here in moving our economy forward. And we will be able to adjust our expectations, adjust our timelines and our protocols accordingly. I can't give you specifics more than that today, but I think we'll be able to make some announcements shortly. Thank you. Um, and my second question, um, it's no secret that there's been a uh, national decline in public health spending over the last decade or so. Um, and I wanted to ask if um, you believe that that has touched um, Maine State Lab's ability to prepare for the mm -hmm. pandemic. And I also wanted to ask if, um, in addition to the most recent announcement, what has the Maine CDC done to increase its um, testing capacity quickly in terms of hiring and improving the facility. And I'm going to ask Commissioner Lambrew to also weigh in on these questions, please. Great. So um, I will t I'll handle the hiring piece and then Commissioner Lambrew is here to chat about the financing piece. So on the hiring piece, um, it takes a lot to conduct testing at a high level quickly and, and, and turn the results around. Having these new supply of reagents and machines is but one piece. So another piece of that is making sure we've got the right number of staff to turn around and keep our throughput level high. That's something we have been working on for several weeks. We're continuing to work on it now, especially with the addition of a higher and steadier stream of reagents. We're going to continue expanding the number of staff members, laboratorians who can run these tests to keep the results coming out. So we're, we're, we're continuing to work on that. Sure, and I will just add that we have been working on improving our public health capacity in the state of Maine since Governor Mills took office. Starting with in the most recent supplemental budget, we both got $1 million for the Maine CDC, which will be available as of July 1. We got $11 million in a working capital fund that we can put towards different coronavirus related activities. And then the federal government has in several of its bills included funding for the Maine CDC, which we have used for several activities. One is staff, not just staff for the lab, but to improve our public health nursing corps to make sure that they can help with all the activities we're doing, to begin to hire contact tracers so we can really, once we identify somebody who is confirmed, begin to make sure that they are self-isolating, their contacts are contacted, and they have the social supports that they need. We also are continuing to look at supplies, the testing kits, the lab equipment, the space. And I will say that when we went into this spring, as early as March, we began discussions with companies like IDEX. We also began to talk about how we can use our laboratory capacity to help validate their tests. And we then engaged with them on the agreement that we announced today of the donated test kits, the Lent platform. And then we will purchase enough reagents to continue to triple the public lab capacity and then continue. Do we need to do more? Can we do more? Mm -hmm. So we are constantly trying to use what has been happening recently, not just to respond, but to strengthen Maine CDC for the long term. Thanks, Thank Caitlin. You. And if I could have one short follow up, um, do you see this testing uh, expansion as any way to move towards universal testing in jails and prisons? It's un uh, so Caitlin asks whether we would move toward universal testing in jails and prisons. Uh, Governor, I'm happy to field that one. Or uh, sure, I mean. I mean, Randy Liberty's been on top of this issue, and the, and the sheriffs have all been on top of this issue in reporting back faithfully. And to date, we have not seen any outbreak in any jails or prisons, uh, and uh, no positive tests. Correct. Correct. So. Yep. Ed, exactly. Thank you. You bet, you bet Caitlin. Uh, we'll turn now to Kara DeRose over at the Main Beacon. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Governor Mills that's a little bit out of left field, and it's related to the rent relief program that went to effect a few weeks ago. I'm, I'm sorry, the what? Um, oh, rent relief program. Okay, um, yes. 
Yeah. Um, so the Maine State Housing Authority, Authority um, reported last week that only 800 renters had received um, support from the program so far. And many renters that we've spoken to are, have said that they don't know about the program. So I'm just curious if the state is planning any kind of public or targeted um, public education campaign to make uh, renters aware of that um, program. Yes, first of all, our figures are a lot higher. I did bring those figures with me today, but I know that um, near about half of the money uh, allocated to the program has been spent. Uh, whether everybody's taking advantage of it or not, um, they should be able to take advantage of it. The local cap agencies are partly responsible for outreach and main housing, and we've been talking with them about getting the word out more widely. We've had very good response on that program though we've had i've had some landlords say I, I i would love to accept the money but i'm just going to forgive the rent for this month because i'm part of the solution to this problem uh, we've had other renters say they don't want to take the rent money because whatever they don't want it um, but those who need it should take advantage of it it's not a lot of money but it's what it is, it's what we can do for now to get people uh, through this tough period and over the hump. Thanks, Kara. We will turn now to Steve Missler over at Maine Public. Uh, what's going on, Steve? Well, I've got a couple, well, several very quick questions, I think. Um, and, and thank you. Uh, how much uh, is there a cost to the state for this partnership is the first one? And, and, and if so, is any of that picked up by the feds and the um, any of the disaster relief uh, bills that have been passed. Um, the other question I have is how many tests can be performed at a time and how does that compare to what the state lab is doing now with its testing? And then the last question Whoa, whoa, wait a minute, is, slow um, down. <laughs> can we answer the first sorry. two first? <laughs> sure. Yeah, Do you yeah, mind? Sorry, whatever, your pleasure. Because I'm going to ask uh, Commissioner Lambert to weigh in on the cost issue as yep. well, if you don't mind. Yep. Sorry. Thank you. So we are committed to being partners, not just in accepting the donated test kits, but to continue to pay for them, again, given the steady supply chain. So we have a contract with IDEX for about $720,000, which again is enough for at least 5000 per month for several months. We continue to look at how do we break down the proverbial walls of the lab and the test staffing limitations to see if we could do more. That is coming from the Coronavirus Relief Fund, which was provided by Congress through the Department of Treasury for purposes like this. So it was 100% federal funding. And then, uh, Steve, your second question was about the, the daily throughput. Um, so right now, our daily, av our daily maximum capacity is right around, around 300 tests per day. Um, and that has been, again, governed largely by the availability of reagents and the fact that we had uh, a limited number of these extractors that you and I have talked about that you've written about. We now have two additional extractors, one, uh, both of which are made by a company called Thermo Fisher, and they are called Kingfishers. Uh, we purchased one, and IDEX was generous enough to lend us one. So we now have two additional extractors. Uh, that coupled with the very robust supply chain of reagents puts our daily throughput a lot closer to about 700 per day. And you had a third question? I did. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I just want to uh, build off of what uh, Caitlin had asked about staffing. And do you have a sense of how many people will be needed to help, you know, to help perform these tests at CDC? Is, is that, or is there, do you have enough to get you ramped up now? Or do you need to actually hire more people in order to sort of complete the ramp up? So it's, it's a little bit of both. Oh, no, no, go yep. ahead. It's, it's a bit of both, Steve. So really the, the, the biggest variable the biggest constraint on increasing our throughput was having more of these extractors, the two kingfishers I mentioned, and the reagents to run them. We do, however, want to make sure we can keep that up. Uh, we don't want to, you know, for example, our lab staff um, have been working seven days a week since March. Most of our lab staff have not had a single day off. Uh, it's not the way that we like to do business. It's not the way to do business. And it's just not the way we want, it's not the type of organization that any of us wants to be running. 
So we are looking to hire additional staff members, both on the intake of result of samples, as well as the actual running of those samples. Uh, the intake is called the sessioning, and then the running requires skilled uh, laboratory technologists to do the actual testing. So we are looking to hire additional folks so that we can keep our staff fresh, we can keep them ready, and because we know that this process is going to entail several, several months. That's great, thank you. You bet, Steve. Uh, we're gonna turn now to Michael Fern over at the Main Edge. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, I have two questions for both of you. Uh, one looks back and one looks ahead. Commissioner Fortman said yesterday her department was largely un unprepared for the pandemic response and had to rework systems, deal with technology issues, move to remote working practically overnight. When did planning for a possible shutdown actually begin and how is it done to the department level? And looking ahead from both CDC and state operations standpoint, uh, what hasn't worked? How would either of you rewrite the, plan, <laughs> the pandemic playbook? You know, Mike, uh, there'll be plenty of time for Monday morning quarterbacking, plenty of time for that. And I'm not gonna engage in that now. We're making decisions every day, nearly every hour on how we can best protect the health and safety of Maine people. These are never easy decisions. Um, we first formed the task force on March 2nd, 60, 67 days ago. And they have been working every day, sometimes day and night to devise new methods for getting done what state government has to do, helping communities across the state, listening to thousands of people, businesses and municipalities and interest groups from all over the state and reflecting on what they've proposed and what they've observed and responding in kind and making the best decisions we can in every department. This isn't a single department by department um, venture. It's a team of people whom I am very proud of from Commissioner Lambrew and Commissioner Fortman to Commissioner Johnson, Commissioner Liberty and Commissioner, Commissioner Sawshuck and so many others. I think we've got the best people working on this right now. I am very proud of this cabinet and all of the members of state government and the state employees who've worked so hard with more than 80% of them working from home right now to model good behavior and keep our numbers low. That's great, thank you. And Dr. Shaw? Go ahead, Michael. Uh, yeah, how did you plan for the pandemic? Because at some point you had to see the data coming in from across the country and start making plans. How did, how did you ramp up for that? Uh, so in mid-December, uh, because of work that I had previously done in Southeast Asia earlier in my career. In mid-December, I started from contacts that I had had for a while, started getting reports from them about a, a pneumonia that had been starting to spread in a central Chinese city that didn't quite match up with any of the known viral pathogens. Uh, some of my colleagues and I started emailing about that. I shared some of that informally with members of my team, some of our medical epidemiologists. And by January 1st, uh, when the World Health Organization declared, uh, when China notified the World Health Organization that there was an outbreak on our hands, my team and I had already been up to speed. Uh, right when we all came back from work after the new year, uh, we started meeting on a, a pretty frequent basis to start thinking about the possibility that the virus could spread to the United States and what would that would look like in Maine. Uh, a few weeks after that, we turned up the dial even more by activating our incident command system, starting to think about diagnostics, starting to think about investigation, and starting to think about case isolation. Those are the same things that we are talking about here today. One of the key pieces throughout all of that has been diagnostics. Uh, and that's why I think today's announcement of, of, of the enabling us at the state level to more than triple our capacity to do testing in-house in the state with quick, res quick results. This is not something that just happened overnight. It's really the result of many months of anticipating what kind of problems could occur and then several weeks of careful, thoughtful discussions about the science and the implementation of this, res of this work with our colleagues at IDEX. I, I just wanna underscore, this isn't just something that we thought about and happened. It's really the result of weeks upon weeks of deliberate thinking, planning, and partnership 
That's why we're delighted to be able to announce that today. And partly because of the great cooperation and courage of Maine people mm -hmm. in following the protocols that we put out there and the restrictions that people have been working under and living under for a couple of months now, mm -hmm. partly be in good part because of the cooperation of Maine people and the excellent people we have heading up this task force. We've been successful, relatively speaking, relative to so many other states, most other states, to date, and we want to keep those figures low. That's right. Uh, we're going to, you bet. Thanks, Michael. We're going to turn now to Amy Brown over at WERU. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. Uh, could you say if there's anything happening or maybe not happening at Tyson and the other places that have had outbreaks that uh, put workers at risk that other businesses can learn from? And then also to follow up on a question I asked several days ago, has any thought been given to opening a hotline or providing other reports for workers who feel they may be at risk in the workplace? Oh. Sure. So I'll, I'll take the first sure. piece of that. Um, and then, um, so Amy, you know, the, as, as the country itself has, has grappled with outbreaks, specifically those at meat and poultry processing plants, there's actually been a lot that's been learned. Um, so much so that just a couple of days ago, the U.S. CDC itself put out a new document around guidance and best practices for meat and poultry processing plants. Uh, we've discussed that document with Tyson and our colleagues there to make sure they are implementing all of those administrative and engineering controls. Some of them involve things like making sure workers are facing the same direction on the line rather than face to face with each other, which reduces the likelihood of transmission. Others of it making, or is in, involves making sure that the right cleaning steps are being taken. So there has been a lot that's been learned. The US CDC has put that document on its website, and I'd encourage any owner or operator of a facility, whether it's a meat or poultry, poultry processing plant or any other type of industrial facility, to take a look at that because many of the controls are applicable to any kind of industrial setting, not just those involving food processing. Um, as to the latter question. With respect to a hotline of some sort, um, we're relying on local law enforcement to some extent because violations of the protocols and violations of the executive orders, whether in a workplace or another public setting or otherwise, they are both potential criminal violations or licensing violations uh, and uh, may be acted upon accordingly. We're relying on, in good part, law enforcement locally to take measures to protect uh, workers and protect the public by enforcing the, uh, the rules and the protocols. Um, if there's no recourse in that uh, local arena, people are free to call the state police, uh, Commissioner Sawshuck's um, department, public safety, uh, call or email. Uh, given that your email may, may be a public document, though, um, and uh, we've had a couple of people call or make, make known some apparent violations, but we can address those by responding with law enforcement or with licensing personnel. Are there any uh, protections for workers who are whistleblowers in that case? Because I see someone who is working, say, as a grocery store clerk, uh, not wanting to go right. to the police and complain and get in trouble with their employer. Yeah, and there are provisions in Title 26. I don't want to play lawyer here or give people legal advice, but there is a whistleblower act that's been on the books for 30-something years that might be available to a person in that situation. And uh, there's also the Maine Human Rights Commission uh, if there's an ADA issue or discrimination issue uh, who may be able to be of assistance. Thanks, Amy. We are going to turn now over to Joe Glauber at WMTW. Thank you both for your time. My uh, question is a two-part question for Dr. Shah. Um, can you talk a little bit about the distribution system for the testing as, um, as the supply starts to increase? Uh, will patients uh, expect that their healthcare facility may have one or will they have to request that? And um, will they be preemptively sent to areas where more cases are starting to be seen? And then secondarily, should we expect to see a spike in cases or any sort of increase in cases related to the larger sample size from just the expanded testing as the weeks and months go along? Great. Uh, Joe, I'm going to take those in reverse order. Joe's first question is whether we might see more cases as a result of more testing now that we've got a more than tripled testing capacity. And the answer, Joe, is that it could be. Uh, one of the things we know in public health and in life 
is that when you go out looking for things, you often find them. And this is a situation where we want to go out and look for things. We want to look under every stone possible to see if there's someone that might have coronavirus, especially in high risk settings like healthcare institutions, congregate care settings. So it is possible that because of the increased capacity, more than triple now at the state level, there will be more testing that's done. That's what we hope. And as a result of that, we may continue to see more cases. Joe, what I would throw on top of that though, is that it's just as important not to look at the amount of new cases there are, but the rate at which those are positive or the so-called positivity rate. What we ultimately want is for that rate to go down because that's evidence that more and more tests are being done, which is evidence that the net that we're casting, the look that we're taking at the state is getting wider and wider and wider. Now you also ask about the distribution of the tests. Uh, and Joe, this is, this is a good question. I'm glad you raise it. The, t the decision of which laboratory to send any patient samples to is ultimately one that's made up by the doctor or her clinic or her hospital. Maine CDC offers this test, but physicians might opt to send their, their specimens to their own hospital's laboratory or a laboratory run by Quest or, or, or LabCorp. We are offering the test to any physician in Maine uh, so who, who so wishes to use it without any restrictions once we go through the validation process. So it's not as if we're sending tests out. Providers send the samples to us just like they would with any other test offered by any other laboratory. Uh, we're going to turn now to Eric Russell over at the Press Herald. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks, guys, for taking the time. Um, a very quick question, I think, for Dr. Shaw. Will you go back and test these probable cases to get a confirmation, or will you not bother? Uh, so Eric asks about probable cases. Um, and there, Eric, the, the, the decision of whether to test anyone who has been deemed a probable case lies with his or her physician. Uh, physicians have opted to test certain of the probable folks and they have been confirmed, in which case they're moved into the confirmed category. Uh, but fundamentally, that decision of whether to test somebody really lies with the physician. Some physicians and some medical groups have said, if you're healthy, you're at home, you're safe, you're doing fine, there's really no need to test you. And part of the reason for that, Eric, is that when someone's home and probably are presumed to have coronavirus, they're supposed to stay home. And so testing them or asking them to be tested might entail them leaving their house and potentially exposing other people. So that's a delicate balance. And that's why physicians are the ones that ultimately work with the patients to jointly in, in, in concert with one another, make the decision about whether to get tested or whether if they're doing well, it's fine to stay home. Uh, the other question I had, it's a little bit of a follow up to Joe's question. Given that, you know, it seems very likely that there's going to be an increase in the number of confirmed cases as we get more testing online, uh, which is a good news, as you said, you want to find out those cases. How do you use new cases as a metric for deciding whether to open the economy? Is it more that percentage that you talk about? Is it more you're looking at um, recovered cases or active cases or hospitalizations? How are you going to use this new data, this expanded data, to inform decisions about how to reopen parts of the economy? Great. Uh, so Eric asks about, I'll, I'll repeat the question and then, yeah. Governor, I'll turn it over to you. Eric asks about, in light of, in light of the fact that we may see an increased number of cases because we're looking under every rock and we're looking under every nook and cranny to look for cases, how does that impact mm -hmm. and intersect with our desire to move toward reopening? Well, I think uh, there's a balancing act going on. And what we announced last week and what Dr. Shaw uh, articulated was a several part test. Testing capacity is critical. So is looking at the data on new hospitalizations and new cases of influenza type symptoms. All of those medical criteria are in play here not one above the all the others but they're all equally important so those are the metrics we'll be massaging in the next few days and weeks mm -hmm. to see where we're going with this and to see how we can look at regions and how we can look at different entities and whether or not we can minimize the spread of the virus given that there will be higher numbers of cases 
though not necessarily symptomatic cases or hospitals, cases requiring hospitalizations, mm -hmm. all of the above. Um, we've got how many people in, on, in ICUs right now? 16, I think. That's correct. In ICU. Um, that's the kind of thing we want to prevent. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. You bet. Uh, we're going to turn now to Joe Cortese over from ABC7. Hi, Dr. Shaw and Governor Mills. Thank you for taking my question. Um, it's a little, I will start off by saying it's a little premature, but there have been a lot of reports going out about in New York when dealing with children and a mysterious disease oh, yeah. very similar to the Kawasaki disease. And I understand it's very similar, but it is not the same. As the main CDC, the first question I have for is Dr. Shaw, has the main CDC and Governor Mills' office talked uh, to any extension about the stage two of the plan of reopening the daycares, which is coming up, uh, day camps, excuse me, which is coming up in less than a month. And um, the last question I have is, do we have any cases or any sort of significant um, issues? I know it's I know it's difficult to talk about, but uh, ages two to 15 years old, do we have any in, in intensive care units around the state of Maine? Okay. I'll that's take the first and the third questions, <laughs> Governor, if that's all right. Um, I'll, I'll answer those really quickly, Joe. So yes, Joe, we are aware of reports that have come out of New York City around younger patients who have some type of an illness that resembles another illness that children have, have been diagnosed with, uh, referred to as Kawasaki disease. We actually discussed that exact issue this morning with some of our pediatricians who are working with us. We're not aware of those reports that have come up to Maine CDC, uh, but there's actually a discussion that's happening tomorrow with members of the pediatric community to alert them of, of this finding and see if they've seen it in any cases in Maine. Right now, uh, what I can tell you, Joe, is that in the age group that you mentioned, two to 15, there are no children who are currently hospitalized in intensive care or in regular care beds. For COVID-19. For COVID-19, <laughs> yes. Yeah, and regarding summer camps, whether they're day camps or overnight camps, which uh, supply so much of the, uh, the happiness of a main summer to so many thousands of children or young people, um, we're working on that. Commissioner Johnson is working on that, along with members of the industry, to see if there's a way we can safely allow them to reopen in some capacity, some degree. Um, it's sort of like opening up dormitories in the fall, too. It's like you know, different protocols for different sectors of the economy. Uh, we're working on that. I can't make any promises yet, but we're hopeful. Good Governor, before I turn to the next question, I'm going to actually, Eric Russell, I'm going to go back to your question really quickly about probable cases who might need to be mm. tested. Um, I, I should have mentioned this, but it really does underscore why having this more than triple capacity at the state is important. To the extent that there were any medical care providers out there who were caring for probable cases and saying, you know, maybe I should test you, but there's just not a lot of availability. We really do hope that the now robust availability of testing at the state lab, if a provider would have otherwise tested this patient, we hope this new capacity at the state lab tilts the balance in favor of that testing if that's what the provider wanted to do. Again, really underscoring the importance of today's announcement as, as to why testing is so important. Uh, so I'm sorry, Eric, Thank I should have mentioned that, but I wanted to chime in on that. I'm gonna turn now to Brad Rogers over at WGME. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, first, I want to ask um, Dr. Shaw, if that's okay, uh, is there an outbreak at the Walmart in Brunswick? We're getting some information that some employees have tested positive for the virus. Nothing confirmed yet, though. Have you heard anything about that? Uh, we're not aware of any outbreak of that nature, Brad. Um, we, of course, will be, as our contact tracing process evolves, if we do get reports of individuals in that area and after they're interviewed, it, it is determined that they were all at the Walmart in, in any particular location, a Walmart or any location around the same time, that will be a signal for us to investigate more deeply. But as of right now, we haven't observed anything of that nature. Okay, and then this is for you or the governor. Uh, the federal CDC came out with guidelines for the country to work uh, toward reopening that's been rejected by the Trump administration. Uh, are you guys, do you guys have that uh, document and are you using that at all? Uh, you know, so, like two weeks ago? Oh, I'm uh, sorry, go yeah, No, yeah. apologies, Governor. You mean the, the CDC guidance of two weeks ago? 
Well, I'm not sure. They, exactly they come out with guidance that. every other day, so uh, trying to keep on top of this. But I'm not sure what parts you believe were rejected by the federal government, or maybe you know more. So, uh, so Brad, um, you know what? Brad asks about some recent CDC documents regarding reopening. And, and Brad, what the CDC created there was not so much a plan for reopening. It was just an update of some models that they had previously been undertaking at the national level to, as all models do, project potential scenarios of what might happen depending on whether certain conditions do or do not come true. Uh, as, as many of you are aware, we've also been undertaking our own modeling exercises within the state. We're aware of the CDC models as well. Uh, I can't speak for where, what happened with those and how they've been viewed or implemented, but we are aware of them. Okay, thanks. You bet. And the last question for today goes to Emily Tadlock over at WABI. Thank you so much. My question um, it could be answered by Governor Mills or Dr. Shaw, even you. Um, I have two questions. The first one, um, you said many of these new tests would be prioritized towards congregate care facilities um, just across the state. With this increased testing, how soon could we see some of these restrictions maybe lifted on nursing homes, allowing people to see their loved ones again? Oh, that's a good question. Boy, there are about 6,800 people in long-term care facilities all across Maine. So we're very hopeful that we'll be able to test people in those facilities pretty soon. And the, and the staff, of course. In terms of reopening the, the homes, that's a different issue because then you're, you are inviting the virus to come in. And uh, as a public health matter, I'll ask uh, Dr. Shaw to comment on that. It's still a very dangerous situation. Thanks, Governor. And Emily, um, and I don't want to quibble, but you use that word prioritization. And uh, once we fully implement this new testing in partnership with IDEX, uh, there will be no prioritizations. There will be testing that is available. Our doors will be open. We might still recommend different categories based on the latest available science, as we always do, but our doors will be open. But as it relates to the nursing homes specifically, reopening nursing homes to visitors is a challenge. What we've seen, not just in Maine, but across the country are that nursing homes and the residents who live in them, our family members, our mothers, our fathers, our spouses, our brothers, they are uniquely vulnerable to COVID-19. And so any decision to reopen them to visitation really has to balance the need to keep them safe from COVID-19 with of course their need to be socializing and interacting with their family. That's gonna be a careful balance and I think will be governed and driven by how we see the data evolving and what we see there. So thanks for that question, Emily. Governor, that was the last question. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shaw, as usual for your um, articulate, succinct uh, comments and observations and reporting. And um, I keep thinking you know, a few years from now, several years from now, when we look back on this strange and difficult time period, what will we remember most? We'll remember what made us sad. We'll remember the reports of people passing away. We'll remember the reports of healthcare workers getting terribly sick and others in our communities getting very, very sick from this disease, this virus. But we'll also remember things that kind of made us excited. And one of the things that makes us excited today is this report of the new partnership with IDEX tripling our capacity that may not seem exciting to a lot of people who sort of aren't in the weeds or aren't paying as much attention as we are but you know my communications director last night he was out fishing when we got the news he almost lost his trout on the line that's how exciting it was <laughs> and it's exciting to us today so we look forward to further progress mm -hmm. and thank you all to the main people, every one of you. I hope you're as excited as we are and I hope that we all keep you safe and you keep yourselves safe in everything you do every day. Thank you. Thanks, Josh.